but you need to be aware that privacy is a fundamental human right and you should be able to choose privacy if you want to not because um, uh, someone else t dictates that you can't have privacy no you should be able to choose privacy if you want to do that and um, yeah, I remember this 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 great interview on Dutch TV once about privacy, and that that was about um, uh, data and internet and, and and privacy. And you know the 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 the, the, the secretary um, who was responsible for for uh, telecommunications said, "Well, I got nothing to hide." Yeah, that's what people usually say. I got nothing to hide, so why you know privacy shouldn't be an issue. Um, so the, the interviewer asked him, so, so what kind of porn you watch? Hmm. And goes, that's none of your business. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't discuss this. This is none of your business. He said, well, I thought you had nothing to hide. So what kind of porn you watch? Have you ever cheated on your wife? You know, he asked all sorts of questions that made him really uncomfortable and blush. And they precisely pointed out that, yes, we all have something to hide. And yes, we all seek privacy. <laughs>
that is always in, in the back of your head, in the back of your mind, like, oh, why didn't I do that? And life goes so fast. And trust me, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm 60 years old and it really, really feels like I've only just got started. And it, it really bumps the, sh the shit out of me, excuse the expression, for, you know, being more than halfway of, of my life already. And it went so fast. I so vividly remember certain events, you know, from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, and it all went in, in a blink of an eye. And I, I find it very important that you do try to seize opportunities and, and, and capitalize on everything that life throws at you. And even if, if, if you jump in it half cocked, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Try, really try and do it. it. You will regret it if you don't. Inspiring words. Now, <laughs> you've been in the technology space uh, for a while now. You got, you got in the internet when it was just getting started. Could you uh, talk more about your experience back then and you know how people gauge the internet and its possibilities around that time? Yes, yeah, definitely. It's, um, I was working for, uh, for an American uh, tech company, AT&T, uh, in, in, uh, in the mid and, and uh, late 90s. And that was just about the same time when the internet developed or became, I would say mainstream, but became a little more known and more people started to use the internet. I think usage was still very low and limited in, in 94 and 95, but yeah, there was a certain group of people using the internet. And I remember I got online in 1994, which was, you know, relatively, uh, relatively early. And I, I remember that I was actually literally roaming the internet for content because there, there wasn't a lot. There was not a lot, um, not a lot of information you could read or stuff you could do. But, you know, the sheer idea of being connected with people via email, just, you know, a simple click of a button, you, you type a message, you send it and boom, that person at the other side of the world gets your message and can read it was, was absolutely, you know, revelation uh, to me. That, that was amazing. Um, Secondly, I remember uh, actually looking for information, and now you have to remember it was before we had Google, right? Before we had Lycos, there was there wasn't really like a search engine. There wasn't really like a, a big place where you could find information. You actually had to, f you, know, find a referral or actually other people that that draw your attention to certain um, uh, certain sites. Uh, or you had to browse through a website of a, a company or an information provider to find certain information, but the information was there. And at the, at the click of a at, at, at a button, you could actually retrieve information um, just sitting behind your desk. Um, that was that was amazing to me, um, and that also for me created. The, the awareness that that we as a, as a global society all of a sudden could be connected and could freely and openly share ideas and and share thoughts and and and, and be connected um, that was something that was um, that was amazing uh, to me and and in a way that was also a, a, a bit of a a, a deja vu of, of what you had with with the hippies in the 60s you know obviously i was i was a toddler uh, uh, then but I, I i do remember the the hippies uh, you know singing kumbaya the campfire and and being all connected and 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 singing and, and being happy and and that first days of the internet that sort of reminded me of that period that there was a lot of possibility and there was a lot of hope and there was a lot of posit positivity um but the idea of of having connectivity um uh, borderless connectivity um, f provided to everyone, available for everyone. That to me was was absolutely an, an amazing revelation when the internet first started. Mm. And I ask this question because as someone who grew up while the internet was in its web two phase, like I didn't really get to experience any of the web one, like uh, optimism. So, you know, by the time I was experiencing the internet, we had Facebook and MySpace, and we we're already in the part where, you know, we've been connected for a while, 
and people are starting to do innovative things like there's a search engine, but now we want to actually connect on a deeper place, which is where like Facebooks and the MySpaces came in. So yep. it's very interesting to like get the perspective of like web one and, and kind of the hope and optimism of where, where this technology is going. Cause that's kind of what we're experiencing right now with blockchain. Like we're still right. in kind of phase one and we still have a hope and optimism of where it's all going to go. Yeah, so correct. actually, one, 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 just, I just remember the first time I actually saw a picture on, 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 on the internet, that was because you have to, it was predominantly text, you know, 99% was text and you got ex excited if you saw a picture. You know? I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre to think of, but you were excited if you actually had, had visuals and pictures uh, uh, on, on a web uh, page. You know, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary how that, how that was um, and how, how crude and, 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 and basic it was. But, you know, it, it, it's, it still showed the potential uh, already between the lines. Yeah, absolutely. And now instead of pictures, we're exchanging real-time video information right now like we're Absolutely. just as we speak live like yeah. i'm not nowhere close to where you live and you're nowhere close to where <laughs> i live yet we're just talking to each other like we're in the same room which is right. yeah. wild um innovation but how do you think the the trajectory of the internet how far or close does it separate from w the initial optimism that that uh, web one was? That's a really good question. That's a very interesting one. And that's also some, an, an issue I, I, I sort of think about. And as I said earlier, when the internet first got started, I was really excited about, you know, the, the connectivity and, and the borderless connectivity, uh, it, it would provide to people that it could share freely ideas, thoughts, information, content, um, whenever we want, with whomever we want, however we want. Um, if we actually look at what the internet now has become, um, it's being controlled and regulated, not not necessarily by government, but it's more regulated by the big tech companies, uh, the, the the fangs, the Facebook, the Amazon, the Alphabet, the uh, Netflix, Google, uh, Meta. Uh, they sort of run the show and they sort of dictate what the internet is and what we can do with it and what we can't. Uh, do with it. Um, that is not what I at least had in mind when the internet first started, and I'm pretty sure that's also not what the people who founded the internet uh, had in mind. Um, it sort of more or less happened, and it's 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 almost classic as how often things happen in hindsight when you look at it. It happened because life became easier. We were given a, a, a certain service, we were given a certain application, we were given a usage, we were given a tool that provided us with something we wanted and not necessarily looking at the potential downside or the negativity of it. So we sort of you know, fell in the trap without us realizing it was a trap. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that the big tech companies are, you know, are, are, are bad. Um, yeah, I, I, I simply can't imagine if we had what life would be today or the economy would be today with Google, without uh, Airbnb, without uh, all the big tech companies, I think uh, life uh, would be different. Um, and I what think we benefited enormously. We benefited enormously from it. Um, you know, we got an economic and, and social, a cultural, uh, and a techno technological booster from it, uh, you know, same as, as Bill Gates did uh, with Microsoft um, uh, by bundling um, uh, a word processor and with, with, an, with a spreadsheet and with a, a graphics program into Office, which we now call PowerPoint, Excel and Word. Um, you know, and, and drag and drop with, with icons, technology became simple. You could simply drag stuff. Uh, you could copy and paste from one application into another. Wow, you know, that made technology useful, that made technology simple, but we all became reliant on one type of technology. Um, is that, is that, is that good? Um, not necessarily, but 
did it gave an enormous boost to business, to uh, to people's empowerment and independence? Yes, to an extent, absolutely, wholeheartedly, yes. Um, so you know that's that's why it's always easy to say, oh, big tech is bad. Yeah, they do some really bad stuff, but they've also given us um, a, a lot of good things and also given us at least an awareness uh, of um, what we want and not necessarily. So, you know, there's always two sides uh, to the coin. Easy as it is to always um, take one side, you always have to look for the nuance, I think, um, to get sort of a balanced opinion and also get, get you know, make sure that you actually fully appreciate um, the, the whole spectrum of it. Um, but I think I was deviating from your original question a bit, uh, uh, Dwayne, but um, um, uh, the sidetrack is, yes, I do see that um, um, a blockchain is, is also in its infancy, uh, and I do see that that development is, 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 is a crucial part. You, you go through growing pains, and sometimes it's also a bit like a pendulum, like you swing from one end uh, uh, to the other, you see that in in politics as well. You know, we, if if you if you vote to the left, you know, next time you vote to the right. In general, as a society, you always you know always shift from one side uh, to the other. Um, that's that's that goes with 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 development. Um, one of the things I actually find interesting in 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 you know the whole Web one, Web two, Web three discussion is that. You know, the internet is say you know 30 years old um it's only now two three years that we're actually talking about the third generation of internet i mean that that actually that's that, that's going quite slow in in a way and it, that that still baffles me that that in hindsight uh, it took yeah you know, more than 20 years to come up with a concept of, of web3 um, that's 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 really interesting well i want to uh go off of that so one of my theories on why it took so long uh, is because of Facebook. And Facebook was one of, like, I respect Facebook in so many ways. They pushed the Internet forward like crazy. Yeah. The whole concept of, like, Internet cookies wouldn't it be a thing. They literally invented Internet cookies. Uh, yeah. Data science, they invented yeah data science and the whole concept of data science, machine learning. So Facebook, they've just been pushing the internet um, far and far to the point where when we became aware that our data was valuable and they were selling our data to, to other like companies for these large amounts, like we we're like, wait a minute. Like, you know, I thought I was just posting a bunch of, you know, random nonsense. And yeah. Without Facebook, the concept of like our data being valuable just wouldn't be a thing. So once we realize that our data is owned by this other giant corporation, that's when we decided to create a solution to that, which is uh, what kind of uh, I would say was pioneered by Ethereum. I don't know if you believe if you agree with that, but like. Ethereum smart contracts gave people the ability to create these uh, different NFTs, which were able to, you know, um, uh, capsulize yeah. uh, data on, on a long, in a longevity type of way. And this data was owned specifically by the user who created it. So I think that's, that's kind of where or how it evolved to the point where Web3 has now become like a thing because right. now have this awareness that our data is valuable and how can we uh, own our data as opposed to someone else who we don't know owning yeah. and, and capitalizing off our, of our data. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And and what you said about Facebook, that's that's definitely true because I I remember when I when the internet first started, you know, the, the web one, uh, people were asking, so, um, are you on it? Are you on the internet uh, now? In Web two, Web two, the question was, um, "Are you on Facebook?" Right, and that. Um, so I definitely agree with your with your comment about Facebook. Facebook, you know, God knows how many billion users um, they um, they have. Uh, it's it's you know it's a staggering staggering number. Um, and I also believe that one of the things we not necessarily will that mindful of the data and the data usage or using our data 
is that we were sort of pacified in, in a lot of the yeah, advantages uh, it gave us. You know, it, wasn't it great to, to catch up with, with, with people from high school or from your childhood, from, uh, you know, who, who went through the diaspora all over the world and, you know, all of a sudden, boom, they were there again. You, you could share and you talk about things um, where, where you left it. Um, that's amazing. And that, that facility um, was so valued that, you know, we weren't even critical about a potential downside uh, uh, of it. And I, I agree with you, Facebook definitely helped people in, in a lot of ways, um, um, socially, emotionally, um, uh, economically. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, it's so easy to be negative about something, but you also, also have to be you know, appreciative of, of the efforts and the contribution that Facebook has brought to our society. And I, I would think our society would have been significantly different if we didn't have internet and we wouldn't have had Facebook. Um, uh, for better, for worse, it would be significantly different. Yeah. And now we have uh, these Web3 innovations such as a DAO, NFTs, uh, DeFi, and just so many new applications that people are like still trying to get their mind around. Like I'm still trying to get my mind around a DAO. And I know you're a DAO ent enthusiast. In the yeah. enthusiasts. So could you uh, help me better understand it? Well, I think DAOs are, are very much to, to, towards where Web3 is and where the decentralized blockchain is. And, and, and let me go back to that one comment I just made about the pendulum. And, and I, I think DAO uh, is, is perfectly um, um, explainable by that, that pendulum that wants to swing the other way. What we see in society is that there's a awareness growing that that centralization or an overreaching government is not necessarily the answer to any and all problem or any and all any and all ch challenge we have and i believe that a lot of people became aware of that also let's say how certain governments in various country approached COVID and measures that were uh, taken and measures that were brought in place to mitigate the uh, effects of the pandemic that also showed us that the government wasn't shying away from extremely invasive and restrictive measures for us, the population. Um, and I'm not going to be judgmental about it, whether that was um, the right thing to do or it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, that's not part of, of, of this, this discussion. Um, people can make their own minds, uh, can make up their own minds about it. Um, it is merely an example that if a government is able to take these measures and go through these enormous length of measures now, they will obviously do that again if the situation dictates that or if, if there isn't a situation. Yeah, once done, boom, it, it sets a precedent uh, for, for the future. That's as simple as that. I do believe that uh, a growing number of people became aware of that. Um, and felt like is, this is not necessarily the answer to any and all problems we might have. So a centralized government or a federalized government is fine, but we also need to make sure that we have certain um, influences ourselves as, as individual, as, uh, as parent, as community. And sometimes you see in America those school debates where parents argue with the school board about a certain part of the curriculum or a gender related issue parents want to claw back responsibility and want to claw back saying about how their children should be treated and how their children should be taught at school now that's a classic example of a drive towards decentralization and again i'm not taking a position or whether that's right or whether that issue they're fighting about is, is the right issue. That's, that's neither here nor there. The aspect of decentralization, the aspect of people to seek empowerment, to seek involvement, and to seek um, influence over decision in the day-to-day -day life, that is a growing phenomenon. And that is definitely something you also see uh, in decentralization and the DAOs. Um, I think that the, the, the blockchain itself is like a counter movement towards um, centralized authorities. And if you read the white paper, you can 
of, of Bitcoin. Um, that's an answer more or less to the movement of, of the big banks. Uh, you know, the, the white paper was, was released in December of 2008, uh, September 15th, 2008. Um, uh, the Lehman Brothers, you know, the bank, the bank started to started to collapse, uh, and it also shown us that actually us as consumers we were at the end of the stick. Whatever happened, you know, the big banks were being bailed out. Uh, the, the bonuses uh, um, were were reduced for one year. The next year they were back in full swing. But as consumers, you know, we were and we were the ones. Ending up holding the baby, uh, so to say, um, and the white paper is, is is addressing that very issue, and that also calls for we need to make sure that we can influence uh, our own decision and avoid that so-called single point of failure. And our financial system is, in that sense, you know, a single point of failure, and also you know a, a massive Ponzi scheme in that sense. I I, I recently saw. Um, uh, the Madoff, um, uh, Madoff uh, documentary on Netflix, and you know it's just shocking um, uh, again to see how the system fails and the people actually, you know, lost the money. Yes, you might say there were there, there was FOMO, there was greed, who knows? But the regulators they were asleep on the watch. The banks were raking in money uh, hand over fist, and the consumer again. The individual client of the Meta Fund ultimately, you know, was 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 penalized and and um, uh, ended up losing a lot of money. So for me, decentralization um, and blockchain is a counter movement in that sense, much much bigger than just the financial system. Um, it's it's it it to me the core of the whole movement is trust. Better said, the lack of trust. Um, when I grew up. You could 100% trust the police, um, trust your doctor, uh, trust the politician, uh, trust the mayor, uh, trust your um, your school teacher. There was trust in in society. Trust your parents, uh, trust your family. There was an intimate trust, a robust trust in the institutions of society. Look at it now. We don't trust the police. We want to defund the police. We don't like politicians. We hate politicians. Um, uh, we, I'm talking we as in plural, as as us as a society. I'm not talking on a personal note. I'm talking for us as a society. So restoring trust is something we need to build on as a society, and that doesn't go overnight. And I believe that blockchain and decentralization can help us mitigate some of these trust issues and help us go back towards that society where we can trust each other. Um, I would welcome that wholeheartedly because um, I do remember how it was that you could talk to people based on trust and based on respect. And that is definitely something that is pretty much out of the window uh, lately. And that's, that is something I regret. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think society they we want to trust these institutions because okay. these institutions are responsible for us right it's okay. responsible for each individual like we want to call the police and not get shot right okay. Okay. <laughs> we we want to go to the doctor and have them prescribe us medicine based on our ailments not based on whatever incentives they have worked out with an insurance okay. company or a pharmaceutical company correct but because of so just to backtrack a bit um adam smith the father of capitalism he wrote extensively about capitalism like the book huge like i've only managed to read half of it like I try to read it over and over, but it's so big and the writing is so small. It's, it's super hard. Anyway, like one of the core principles of capitalism is that you need a strong governing body to govern the transactions between like companies. So that if company is promising you like the cure to something, but they're giving you like sugar pills, then 
the government should step in at that point and punish the company. And that's how capitalism is supposed to work. But with regulatory capture, uh, that's not able to happen because the corporations are pretty much ruling the government, which is like upside down. So now you can't trust the government because the government um, is being influenced financially by 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 the entity that they're supposed to be governing, right? And that's what's flipping the whole thing and that's what's distorting reality. So we can't really trust anything because we don't understand what each individual's incentive model is at. So that's where blockchain comes in and it kind of gives us a transparency uh, filter so we can identify exactly what incentive models are are associated with any any entity that we're supposed to be trusting. So, you know, that's 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 huge. Now, my only thing is I'm not really sure if blockchain could accomplish its lofty goals because theoretically it can, but it's it like the the competition is up against like they they have so much money and they have so much influence that I'm sure they can find a way to co-opt blockchain and then repackage it and sell it as 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 what we believe it should be, but it's not. Like what what's your take on that? That's that's almost how we started. Uh, that's a philosophical question. Uh, yes, I agree with you that that blockchain um, um, is most likely not a perfect system uh, uh, either. The, um, let, let me compare it to, to democracy. And um, democracy, you know, even, even Plato uh, in, in beginning said he was, he was an, an, an advocate for democracy, but he also more or less said, you know, some people are just, you know, too stupid to vote. Um, so we should actually leave it to people who actually are, are insightful and and you know know their business uh now on that concept we more or less develop the representative uh, democracy so you know you and i both live in a representative democracy not in a democracy we actually elect people uh that represent us to vote on things um and sometimes we make colossal mistakes and vote someone into office we think oops well we probably shouldn't have done that. That's, you know, you need to wait four years and then, you know, you can um, ha have another cycle. Uh, so, yes, there is definitely an issue and a flaw in, in every system. Um, I also believe that sometimes, even though the system isn't perfect, uh, it's probably one of the best things we have. So um, we need to stick with it and we need to keep going with it. Um, I think um, um, uh, Rukard, that that French philosopher, once wrote that, you know, the, um, after the the revolution in America and, and the Declaration of Independence, you know, it's the, the the biggest human experiment ever. And he is right; it's still an experiment. We are still figuring it out as we go along. Uh, sometimes we really hit it on the nail. Sometimes, you know, we completely miss the mark. Um, I do believe that blockchain is potentially flawed as well. Um, does it mean that we should start and, and, and developing a concept or a construct that is, is absolutely perfect and then work on blockchain? Or should we start working on blockchain and develop the kinks on as we go along? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I think the latter. Um, and I do believe that the democracy in America is in that sense a classic and, and a great example. Um, if you look at how the, the democracy developed um, in 1776 versus what it is now, um, great strides, great progress uh, has made also some blemishes on, on, on its stain. But overall, it is something that the society of today still feels, okay, that's a good concept. I feel confident and comfortable with it. Um, to a large degree, to a large extent. Um, and I do believe uh, we need to follow that with blockchain as well. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, uh, whoever he, she, or they were, um, gave us some guidelines, a rough idea. That that doesn't mean it was first finished. It was, uh, you know, this is it. Um, this is the manual. No, 
It is a train of thought that needs to be developed. That is work in progress. As the founding fathers did, so, so did Natasha, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. We need to make sure that we bear in mind that we are developing something for the future. And that's not finished. That has flaws. As long as we're mindful and aware of those flaws, we can try to mitigate them. Um, but that doesn't mean that we need to stop it now and, and uh, perfect the system um, and get a regulatory framework in place and a whole governance structure in place and, and then say, okay, now, we, now we're good to go and then we, we press the start button. Um, um, as with the pendulum goes, so does the blockchain go. Even within blockchain, you will find uh, certain movements that we go through. And, you know, 2017, for instance, was a movement with, with all those, you know, bizarre ICOs. You know, you could rake in millions, uh, just, you know, write a, a white paper. People wouldn't read it anyway. Uh, <laughs> you would rake in the millions uh, as, 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 as a company. Um, now we became more critical of that. So there is sort of this self-regulatory um, uh, phenomenon and movement within the blockchain and within society um, that sort of helps us uh, stay on top of things and on top of developments. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I totally understand what you say and I don't disagree with it. Um, but I also feel that we need to keep going where we're at as long as we're mindful of uh, certain pitfalls and of certain risks and also be aware of the responsibility we, we, we carry uh, developing blockchain. So when I bring that up as a criticism of blockchain, it's not to derail it as a technology. It's more to, you know, warn us like in the community to be mindful of potential, you know, valleys where JP Morgan, for example, they obviously have their eyes on blockchain and yeah. they outwardly say they don't like blockchain. They don't support it, this, that, and the other, but inwardly they're like buying it and investing in it. That I think they're co-owners or they, they own a lot of the Ethereum organization. So, you know, I don't trust JP Morgan and, you know, like, I think we just have to to be alert that these powerful organizations are out there and they're looking for a way to like overtake and control the whole industry. And I think like we should really be aware of that because they can like repackage some bullshit and try to sell it to us as like, this is what you've been looking for. This is decentralization and all this other stuff when it's really not. So I think... So that's my only, that's the only point that I'm making when I, when I make that criticism. Yep. Now we yep. should just be aware that there are these vultures out there and they're, they're, they're circling around and they're looking for any like hole that it can strike to, to like take over the entire industry. Absolutely. And I think the big banks definitely look at it like, uh, like this, eh? uh, Waving, waving hole with one hand and yes, come in uh, with, with the other. And they do the same thing. They publicly say, oh, no, it's bad. It's, 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 it's a Ponzi scheme. It's, uh, uh, it's hot air. It is based on nothing. Uh, it's a fad. It will blow over. And in the meantime, they are investing in it. Um, you know, just 90% of all the Bitcoin, for instance, is in, is in 10% of the wallets. Well, go figure. Um, yeah. Right, that's that's, and there's a lot of institutions in those ten percent. I, I I would pretty much imagine. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I agree with you um, with the position of of, of the banks, um, and 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 the banks, you know, they, they're smart enough. They know where the money will is and, and the money will go to. Um, all they do is is wait for the right moment to. Okay, now we'll we go publicly in, or now we we, we show our hand. They're waiting for for the moment, but you know. I'm, Pretty sure a lot of them are, are already have a scenario uh, ready as to uh, how to deal with blockchain and how to deal with Bitcoin. Absolutely, I, I guarantee with you. It's and that even and uh, apart from the history of, of the banks, I don't trust the banks in this position either. No, I, I don't believe that they say it's, it's, it's bad. No, of course that it's not. It, it's not bad. It, it's, it's perfect for them. I mean, uh, you know, what could you possibly as a bank say against blockchain? It's 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 almost made for you in that sense. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it'll it'll help them because I think they suffer a lot of like bank fraud, like billions of dollars in bank fraud. And if they implement it like a blockchain system, it'll save them all of that money <laughs> because it's all on the blockchain and they can trace it. So, you know, whatever goes wrong, they can trace back that transaction to the to the source and figure Correct. it out. So, yeah, it, like, but there's also there's also a downside for banks, and that's obviously um you know that's that's you know if you talk to a banker you know the, the big elephant in the room is, is is money laundering and um uh, you know officially i think money laundering and big and, and blockchain i think banks have the exact same position uh oh no money laundering is really really bad and in the meantime yes you know please come 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 to me come to me come to me to launder your money but it's it's um and, and that's why some sometimes I'm, i get a, a little yeah, I, I can see the irony of it. Uh, you know, we need to uh, monitor, uh, you know, small transactions of individual consumers uh, under 100. You know, there's a proposal in the Netherlands now that even transactions of 25 to 100 euros, you know, should be monitored by banks. It's, you know, just to prevent money laundering. It's like, okay, if I transfer 25 euros to someone, you know, that is that really need to be on the radar for money laundering? Um, um, but, you know, big banks... Um, um, I, 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 the money they launder is, is 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 still enormous, and they honestly get only a, a slap on the wrist. Yes, they get a, a fine of five hundred million dollars, and it sounds like a lot of money, but it's at the end of the day that that most likely is still the tip of the iceberg, and has still been very much um, worth the bank while to uh, to do so. So, um, having a, a a fully transparent blockchain. Uh, that would also make, not make it easier for banks to, to facilitate in money laundering. And I'm not saying banks actively, knowingly, and willingly embrace money laundering. I am. Uh, but they do turn a, turn a blind eye here and there. I mean, with the example of Deutsche Bank, uh, it came out of few, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. They were like taking money from the cartels. And yeah. like yeah. War criminals, all types of shit. Yeah. I mean, yo, <laughs> Deutsche yeah. Bank is yeah. not the example to bring up if you want to protect the banks. No, <laughs> no, and, and and they get a slap on the wrist. I mean, I think they they paid a couple of billion in in, in in fines over the past few years, and and for you and I, that's that's like a colossal sum of money. Uh, uh, you know, for, for who wouldn't it be a, 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 an enormous sum of money? But for for these banks, it's it's an operational expense. It's, it's a cost of doing business, and um, uh, you know, and that's the perspective you need to look at it. Uh, but you know, that would also mean that they would, with blockchain, um, compromise a certain clientele or a certain group of of business that uh, uh, might be lucrative at the moment. Right. So. Now, let's go back to Satoshi Nakamoto. And me personally, I don't care who Satoshi Nakamoto no, is. Me neither. Like, just doesn't matter. Like, to me, he's like, what's a good example? He's like Jesus, right? Yep. Like, doesn't matter who Jesus was. It wasn't, doesn't matter if he was black, white, whatever the case is. The fact is that what he did in his lifetime was so significant that those events reverberate all the way like two two millenniums later, right? We're still thinking back and philosophize philosophizing on like the events that happened two thousand right. years ago. Right. So that to me is the equivalent of what Satoshi is in the financial sense. Like the events right. that he did, his technology is so significant that two thousand years later, I'm sure people will be looking back at Satoshi and like really trying to understand hopefully there's not any like satoshi cults or whatever <laughs> but but the thing is like what's so great is like going back to 2017 you know there were two there were two different cults there are two cults arguing about what's the real bitcoin there's the bitcoin core guys and there's the bitcoin cash guys and and the bitcoin cash guys they just forked forked it and the technology is built in a way that if you don't agree with like how the technology is going, you can just fork it and then create your own path. 
And now the Bitcoin Cash guys are doing whatever they do, and the Bitcoin Core guys are doing whatever whatever they do. And there's Bitcoin Diamond and Gold and all this other stuff. And I think that's one of the great um, innovations in the Bitcoin pro protocol. That if you don't like what's going on in your particular protocol, you could fork it and do something else. And it's up to the community to figure out which one of these protocols they're going to give their value to. So Correct. I always thought that was very interesting. And like, what, what are your thoughts on that in particular? Uh, um, quickly go back to, to what you said about Satoshi Nakamoto. And I, I, I do believe that um, I, I don't care either um, what the identity is. And, and, and actually, in all honesty, I, I hope we'll never find out. Uh, to me, it's part of the... Uh, it, 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 it's part of the, the it, it, magnetism, uh, I, I would say, of it that we don't know. Um, of all the things, um, it is shrouded in, in a certain level of mystery, and that, that to me makes it even more um, uh, interesting in that sense. Uh, so, um, but the white paper itself, to me, um, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if in, let's say, 100 years from now, um, People would say, well, that's actually comparable to the Magna Carta or the deed of abjuration or the declaration of independence or it, it's that profound document that actually showed a new way of how to interact and how to cooperate and how to organize yourself as a society. Um, I would not be surprised that in a hundred years from now, we look at it at, at, at that scale. Um, and that makes it even more special that we don't know who, 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 uh, who, who wrote it. Um, so that was a, a little side step. Um, um, and now I forgot actually your other question you had, to, uh, Dwayne. It was the, the question was about forking in that whole. Oh yeah, yeah. System. Yeah. But I, I think it's important that people have a recognizable identity, and and you see it everywhere. Right. If people, um, 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 if, if if you go to to a, a big international event, you know, lots of people have have a small little flag of the country they come from, or um, symbolize a certain flag, or you know, a certain letter for, from the alphabet to to say, okay, I'm I'm from this gender uh, uh, group. Uh, you know, it's it's we all have the need to identify, to label ourselves and to have a certain uniqueness. Um, um, and I, I, I feel that we have that same movement in, in the blockchain as well, that people want to say, okay, you know, this is me or, or this is us. Uh, we want to distinguish ourselves because we're slightly different than them because we find this more important or we want to uh, emphasize that. Um, it, it's, I, I merely see it uh, in that sense, um, uh, forking is, um, I would say, growing pain. Um, but but the phase where you go through, in a sense of um, identification and and of relevance, and um, it, it's you know, if people want to do that, you know, be my guest. Um, uh, you can do so. Um, but at the end of the day, it will also will ultimately lead back to a certain level of of clustering. You either die out. Uh, or you, you you cluster back to something, and um, uh, to, to me, it's very much comparable to what you see in society. We all have the need to uh, to identify as either wearing a specific set of glasses, or a certain footwear, uh, or or you know a little flag on your on your backpack uh, when you're uh, when you're backpacking to say that yeah I'm, I'm from there. It's we all do that in in different ways, subtle, overtly, covertly. We all do it. Um, and, and to me, the blockchain in that sense isn't, isn't any different. And I guess with, what, with, with blockchain and, and forking is even more so is that it, um, um, it is so new. So we're still finding our voice and we want to make sure that a certain voice is heard. Um, so for me, it's, 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 it's part of, of where we're at, I guess. So let's see. We have coins tokens, NFTs, DAOs, like how does this all, how does this all connect to each other? <laughs> well, let me start with DAOs because we haven't really discussed DAOs yet. Well, 
you know, when we were talking about society and 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 lack of trust, and that we sort of in a, in a in a in a certain headed in a certain movement and direction. Well, to me, that culminate, culminates in, in Dao, um, because we can have that idea, we can have the the thought of being decentralized or want to have a more empowered life. At one point in time, you want to structure your voice and also want to combine your voice with people who think alike. And that's where the DAO actually comes in as a very useful vehicle. Um, and the DAO is also a good, great vehicle for um, uh, deal with ambiguity, with, with people having different opinions. How do you deal with that? Well, in the real world, we shout and the person who shout, shouts the loudest usually wins the argument. Uh, in a DAO, we do that slightly different. We uh, have a debate, uh, we bring in arguments, and based on merits, we arrive at a conclusion, at a consensus that is not necessarily ideal for everyone, but is workable for everyone. Um, and that's where the, the sense of being heard, that your voice is important and relevant, and your voice is heard, uh, is important, and that's where the DAO is an important vehicle and an important structure. Um, I live in the Netherlands, and what we see in the Netherlands when we have elections, that each time we have a poll, fewer and fewer and fewer people show up to vote. You know, that we used to have people, 85% eight, of the people vote. Um, we we had elections where less than 50% of the people actually show up and vote. Uh, European Parliament should be one of our most important votes. No one actually understands what they do. No one understands what their relevance is. No one actually knows a politician. You know, I think less than 40% of the people showed up for the poll. You know, that's 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 really sad. That's 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 where we are as a society. Um, I do believe in that sense that, that blockchain and DAOs can actually um, garnish some of that and, 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 and make sure that we come together as a community and actually have our voice heard. So that's why DAOs for me are very important. Um, now, where do the tokens and the, and the coins come in? Well, we do need to cast a certain vote. Well, how do we do that? How do we represent ourselves within a community? At the moment, you can do that easily via tokens. Uh, and at the moment, if you do that uh, based on how many tokens uh, uh, you have, then obviously uh, still a minority uh, dictates uh, the result of the outcome. Well, then people came up with the concept of quadratic voting. So. You can also indicate not necessarily binary yes or no, but also can indicate which of the proposals you find most important and why. So that gives a bit more voice to the to the minority uh, in the in the population. Um, that's a perfect example of where the DAO can actually listen to the voice of the people and making sure that your voice is being heard. Um, so therefore, um, I think. The DAO can be such an important vehicle and an instrument to explore for future use and also, again, in restoring or building towards restoring trust in society and in the institutions that are supposed to represent us. Mm -hmm. So, pretty much, DAO... No, no, no. <laughs> I, I want to dive deeper into DAOs. So, pretty much, DAOs are these community-run um, would they be blockchain pro? They're not protocols. They're like community run blockchain projects, right? It, it, could be. it doesn't have to be a blockchain project. Um, and if, if you look at the homeowners association, for instance, well, you could more or less see that as a, as a DAO. Um, yes, you have a president, uh, you know, someone needs to call the meeting, someone makes notes, someone who looks after the, the money, but it's all being done accountable to all the, to all the homeowners. Uh, so that's a quite, uh, although there's a certain hierarchy in, in positions within, within the board of a homeowners association, but the association itself is flat. Everyone is equal, everyone has one vote. 
Uh, so you could more or less say, well, that is a type of DAO. Um, it's very close to the issues at hand. Um, uh, you deal and discuss issues that directly involve you, and you, as a homeowner, can directly participate in the outcome of, of the vote. Um, we tend to think as DAOs as merely an instrument exclusively in, in blockchain uh, or in crypto, uh, but it, it, to me it goes much, much wider than that, and it should go much wider than that. Mm. Okay. But pretty much uh, it's up to the community to assign these roles. Is that correct? Science it's community design governance, and that's and that's a very in, important instrument that the community itself says, okay, this is the rules we're going to play by. Um, and quite often we're, we're in, um, in a situation where the rules are given to us. Uh, we had no influence uh, over the rules uh, that, that govern us. Um, in, in a DAO, the governance is, um, is created by the community and that um, uh, the community generated governance. And that's, that's an important component of a, of a DAO. Okay. Let's go back to a conversation we were having earlier where you brought up Plato's Republic, right? And in Plato's Republic, he talks about democracy and say that like everyone's too stupid to vote. So like, you should have an elected or a representative to vote, and that's that's a republic. And, but he has another one that he uh, goes that's that's above that, which is the spiritual leader king, like the king who's also like a spiritual yep. leader type thing. And like, do you think a uh, DAO fits any of those models that were uh, displayed in Plato's Republic, or does it? Or is it, is um, in, in, in a way, with a little, with a little imagination, you could definitely see that. I, I think what what Plato uh, uh, envisioned was um, was a world that autocracy, you know, one person in charge, uh, wasn't not, wasn't necessarily the best solution. Um, you needed to have uh, multiple views and multiple people participating in decision making. Um, he wanted to do that broadly, so everyone should have a say, but he also said, well, not everyone is smart enough to make up his mind, and also not everyone literally shows up to cast a vote or to participate in that process. So that eliminates already a certain uh, degree of people uh, in, the, in that process. Um, so um, if, if, if Plato was envisioning a DAO, I guess... I guess you could call it a DAO for those days because it, it was revolutionary uh, to have a participatory um, a structure where you could participate directly yourself uh, into decision making. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's in that sense that, that he looked at the word um, uh, governance, uh, which means um, steer. And he wanted to make sure that, that, that steering uh, was done according to um, rules or principles we thought we thought about, not haphazardly. Um, uh, so yeah, it is definitely a, a very important first step towards um, a democracy or a DAO. Um, but for that day, it was definitely um, a revolutionary. I would say. Mm. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> And I'm I'm glad that we gave. I don't know, like because we we in the West in America, the United States, uh, we call what well, we have a democracy, but it's not technically a democracy. It's a republic, but with all the rich people kind of making the rules. It's more of a oligarch. So it's I don't know, like these these terms can be evolved into conf confusing, you know, definitions. Correct. Um, well, that's definitely true what you mentioned about stakeholders. I mean, theoretically, um, uh, a multinational can't vote, uh, yet we all know that they obviously have an enormous uh, influence uh, and can give direction 
uh, to policy and, and, and legislation, uh, for sure. Um, um, the, the funding of politicians or the, the lobbying from, um, uh, from, from people in Congress is, um, is, is, is big business. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's, that's not necessarily an ideal uh, uh, situation. It is far from democratic. Um, you know, that's one of the things I would say as a democracy, you should be very much aware of that, you know, wh which stakeholders do you let uh, participate in the debate uh, and how open are you in that discussion uh, with, with the stakeholders. And I'm not necessarily convinced that politician or, or uh, lawmakers are open and transparent and who they talk to and, and un, under what terms they talk to uh, to people. Um, so that's that's definitely a compromising part of, of, of democracy. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, let's also talk about PIVX because that's also a, um, a blockchain project that you're associated with. And I like privacy coins. Now, I know a lot of my uh, opponents for that argument are going to say, you know, privacy coins are used for money laundering and this, that, and the other. But yep. actually, the biggest privacy coin is the U.S. dollar, right? Because <laughs> you can't track those, and yeah. it, it can be used for money laundering as well as a, a bunch of other things. So, absolutely. So, yeah. a that that's one point. But another point is that I think we live in this era of i think jordan jordan peterson calls it postmodernism, which is like mm -hmm. this moral relativism thing which is you know everything is like nothing is defined by the collective but it's de defined based on an individual's perspective on what the what the idea is right so you know uh someone who I don't want to get too controversial. <laughs> I don't want to get too controversial, but you you understand what postmodernism yeah. is, yeah. and it's this moral relativism that that makes it hard to to support a cause without causing backlash, especially if everyone knows like that you've su supported this cause because you don't have a privacy aspect, right? And the thing about this moral relativism is that, you know, multiple people can believe different things, but like if for some reason you believe one thing, which is closer to your faith, which according to moral relativism is like a bad thing, then the group, the outside group can attack you. So it's good to have like a privacy shield so you can still vote your conscience if you were like participating in like a DAO like environment, yeah. How do you respond yeah. to that? Okay, let, let me first start start about privacy. Um, and one of the reasons I, I joined Pivx as, as a project is that you know the, the ultimate belief within the Pivx community is that that financial transactions should be private. It's a fundamental right. Privacy is a fundamental human right. Um, and you should have the ability to freely exchange cryptos uh, if you choose to do so. And this, if I give you a $1 bill or you give me a $1 bill, that's between you and I and no one knows. That's private. So cash is still fully private. Um, so why can't we have a digital form of cash that is fully private? And, um, and that's the reason why PIVX um, was originated, to provide precisely for that service. And it's not that PIVX is automatically a private coin. You as a sender or you as a recipient can choose a degree of privacy. Most you most people um, in who use PIVX use it as a, as a meter, mode of exchange and not necessarily cloak or not necessarily have that private. It is up to you. You can choose to do so. Um, and 
yes, the first thing that people always say is, oh, it's money laundering, oh, it's terrorism, oh, it's this, and oh, it's bad. I'm not saying that old chestnut, but it's it's you know it, it's it's always the same response. People that people have to privacy, but you need to be aware that privacy is a fundamental human right, and you should be able to choose privacy if you want to, not because um, uh, someone else t dictates that you can't have privacy. No, you should be able to choose privacy if you want to do that. And um, you know, I, I remember this 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 great interview on Dutch TV once about privacy and that that was about um, uh, data and internet and, and, and privacy and you know the the the, the, the secretary um, who was responsible for for uh, telecommunications said, well I got nothing to hide you know that's what people usually say I got nothing to hide so why you know privacy shouldn't be an issue um, so the the interviewer asked him so so what kind of porn you watch Hmm. And I go, that's none of your business. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't discuss this. This is none of your business. I said, well, I thought you had nothing to hide. So what kind of porn you watch? Have you ever cheated on your wife? You know, he asked all sorts of questions that made him really uncomfortable and blush. And that precisely pointed out that, yes, we all have something to hide. And yes, we all seek privacy. Um, and privacy, in that sense, should be a fundamental human right. Um, Another argument, I would say, is... Even if I don't have nothing to hide, even if I don't watch porn and like I'm the squarest person on the planet, it's still none of your business what I do, right? Absolutely. That's, that's, the, that's the essence of that argument. Like it's nobody's Correct. business what I do with my life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, that's absolutely, uh, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so uh, I don't know how it's set up over in Europe, but over here we have like a fourth amendment right to privacy. Do you guys have any uh, laws that guarantee your privacy over there? Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah. Ah, super cool. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's one of the good things about, about those laws. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes there's friction. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. That, that happens with, with, with laws. Uh, laws always have friction. Um, um, freedom of expression, you know, as, as a classic example, uh, that always leads to friction. Uh, my right to express myself versus your inconvenience of being insulted uh, to the core of your bone. Um, that, 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 can, that can conflict. Uh, um, that uh, laws always uh, conflict uh, in that sense, but luckily we have discussions about it, we have debates about it, we have uh, Supreme Courts who, who deal with that um, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, but um, uh, privacy is definitely an issue that is becoming more and more aware of people, uh, more of pe top of people's mind, um, but it's also Interestingly enough, a bit generational, and um, I've, I've, I've noticed that a lot of millennials seem to throw privacy under the bus without even realizing what they're giving up, and 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 that is something I find concerning. So there's quite often not even awareness to the fact that you actually uh, sign over a degree of privacy or are giving up something that you're not even aware that you're giving up or not valuing what you're giving. And, and that is something I do find concerning in the whole privacy debate, uh, because we tend to look at privacy more as, as in the extremes of, of, of terrorism, or money laundering, or, or child pornography, uh, we're looking at in, in those spheres. Um, while most of our lives, for instance, Google knows more about you than you probably do, uh, and they know more about me than I probably aware of. Um, is that scary? Yeah. Does that make me uncomfortable? Yes. Do I find that's wrong? Absolutely. Um, you know, and and I, I try to mitigate that minusculely wherever I can, um, but um, the awareness quite often isn't even there of privacy, and that makes privacy such a, a issue that we need to keep talking about and, and also make sure that it gets out of the realm of, of 
illegality. It's not necessarily privacy and something illegal. We, we tend to, to, to see that in the same sphere. It isn't. Privacy is about everything who I am and, and who I embody uh, and everything that's no one else's business. That's privacy. Yeah. And uh, ironically, just as privacy the, um, discussion has brought everything that we've been talking about full circle, because we've been talking about uh, Web3 and how Web3 is more about, you know, preserving in individual like data. And then right. we have this privacy discussion, which kind of caps it all off. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. So, I think that's a perfect place to end our podcast. Um, as usual, we like to give our guests the last word. So go ahead, Hans Koning. Thanks, Dwayne. Well, f first of all, I'm, I'm just shocked that we talked for well over an hour. I mean, the time really does fly when you're having fun. Absolutely. And that brings me to the second point. It was absolutely amazing chatting with you. And it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't an interview. It wasn't a podcast. To me, it was just a really nice chat be between two people who are interested in new technology, see potential for it, and want to make sure that other people um, are opening up and warming up to that technology as well. So thank you very much for your questions and, and for your challenging questions, uh, for your interesting questions, and for engaging in a nice conversation with me. I very much appreciate that. Uh, for people uh, who are listening and want to do a certain homework or a follow-up, there is so much to read, there is so much to see, there is so much to do, but education, education, education starts with awareness. So please make sure that you try to embrace something you don't understand. If you, if you remember that of this podcast, I'd be really happy. Awesome. And also, I want to extend uh, an invite to come back on in sometime in the future uh, so we can have a follow-up pod podcast. I very much like that. Wild horses wouldn't drag me away. <laughs> awesome. 